This is a Stock Trade and Reality Podcast, episode 177. It's better to trade often and get out and be mechanical than it is to trade, you know, only 10 trades a month or something and, and uh, try and hold out for max, max profit. This is the Stock Trading Reality Podcast, where you get to see the realistic side of a trader's journey. Get inspired and stay motivated by everyday normal people who are currently on their journey to trading success. He can't stand the logic of hold because the price will always go back up. Play Trader. Yeah, I have a feeling that our steam co-host Chez is going to agree with the fun fact here, but the whole, yeah, I'm going to hold. I'm going to hold because it's going to go back up. It will go back up. Prices always go back up. Chez, is that one of the those uh, philosophies, I guess we'll call it that, that you've heard in that customer service box that kind of really grinds your gears like it does mine? I was going to say grinds my gears is an understatement on that. But um, yeah, holding something that's uh, in a mean, wicked downtrend approaching, you know, sub dollar marks and uh, oh yeah, it's going to go back up to $35 a share. I'm like... You can keep dreaming, but um, I mean, sure, it's possible it could do that, but uh, the yeah, odds of it happening are, are very, very, very low. Yes, yeah. it drives me nuts. Now, does it happen a lot if you just hold and will it go back up? It does. Does it happen if you're doing like some blue chip stock over the course of 40 years? Yeah, it, it does a lot of times in those situations. But when you're looking at things and applying that philosophy from like a trading perspective, uh, but there's there, there, that, that's a little too basic. So don't take a general philosophy such as, well, you know, uh, you know, I don't, let's see, Procter and Gamble have been around for you know, hundred years, and their stock, you know, if you look at the hundred-year chart, it always goes back up. It's in a long-term uptrend. Yes, that is true, the hundred-year chart. But if you're sitting there as a trader thinking, well, I'm going to hold just another hour, just another day, just another week, because they always go back up, you may be sitting there for a while, and guess what? At that point, you're no longer a trader. You're just sitting there you know, turning yourself from a trader into an investor, and that's just not trading. So it's it's much better from a time value of money perspective to just cut losses uh, when your strategy says you should cut losses, because yeah, nothing is guaranteed to go back up. But uh, so today we have a welcome back interview. We're talking with uh, Jeff, and we go over who is, what his alias is in the chat room. Uh, but a great discussion. We go down some really great rabbit holes, um, and they pertain to do with options, yes, but just the overall kind of concept of, you know, you know, maybe you've heard it before, maybe from Ches and I, everybody's different. And sure, that sounds great, but what does everybody's different actually mean? Well, we have some great examples of how that actually plays out in the real world within our discussion. So yeah, let's break down Jeff and his current journey. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Now, I, I actually did my homework and you were last on episode 131. Uh, so almost about a year ago, and actually, it might have been a year since we last talked, but sometimes we have buffers built in. So maybe right, it, it, right. it was a, a, about a year since we last talked, but since your last actual public episode, right around a year. And uh, again, just in case Ches and I missed it in the intro, uh, he goes by Crestron, Crestron Wizard. Yeah, I think the last it. time I said it was Creston, or I always, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I'm, I missed the R, but it's Crestron Wizard in the chat room for those of you that hang out in there. And um, I really have no idea what we're gonna talk about, but that's uh, the beautiful thing about these Welcome Back episodes. There's no structure other than no structure at all. Uh, so I guess, right. as we always ask, and try to nutshell it the best you can, but walk okay. us through kind of where you were back when we last talked to you in episode 131. Kind of just summarize uh, your whole journey and then where you were when we uh, you know, last left off to the best of your ability. Okay, wow, yeah, well, you know, now you say it's been a year. It seems like it's been, in some aspects, it seems like it's been a couple of weeks, and others seem like it's been 10 years. You know, it's been crazy. But uh, as far as trading goes, in a nutshell, you know, I did the, we kind of gone from where I did the penny stock world and, you know, uh, all that crap that that entails. And um, then had built a business and had just sold the business earlier in the year when we talked last. And I was gearing up, looking towards uh, coming off a divorce and getting ready to move and all this other stuff. So I was gearing up towards uh, trying to maybe trade full time starting in October. So that's kind of where we left off. Okay. And just uh, penny stock and I quote crap. Yeah. I know we talked about this. <laughs> 
But just, you know, listeners in case, I mean, kind of nutshell, why yeah. are you attaching crap next to penny stocks? <laughs> nutshell that little part of your journey uh, for us. All right, so, uh, you know, to begin with, you know, I, I, I you know, on the last episode we kind of talked about it was that I had uh, uh, bought into a company, ended up selling product for the company, um, and, you know, then when it ran up, I didn't sell, you know, because, of course, it was going to go to a million dollars and we were all going to be, you know, retired. And uh, <clears throat> so that was my my foray with penny stocks. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I traded a few after that. But, you know, it was just, you know, suggest people listen to your course because, you know, when I listened to it, you know, penny stocks was the first one I listened to and it was everything hit home from there. So, you know, just that... Uh, you know, you're not buying a real company and uh, you're just, you're basically, you're, you're on you're one side. You're buying hopes of, and dreams. You are. You're, you're, either, you're buying hopes and dreams and the other people are, are uh, just doing whatever they can to, it, it's a, it's a form for, for con men, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I think that's the. Yeah, it, it, it's sketchy. It's sketchy. And I always, I remembered somebody was like much more involved in penny stocks and I couldn't remember who that was, but as soon as I pulled up, uh, your episode from 131 and saw the title. I'm like, ah, that's right. That was Jeff that actually started to, um, you know, literally you were selling their products and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, I would say that you probably had more of an excuse than other people because you were actually selling something tangible. Uh, but so for those of you, here's a guy that, because the bar set so low for penny stocks that people are like, oh, well, they have a product. Therefore, they're legit. Here's a guy right. that was actually selling a product in his business and they still ended up not being legit. Not because necessarily they were scammers, but uh, you know, penny stocks are penny stocks for a reason. Um, right. You know, because they're usually loaded down in debt and toxic financing. But yeah, I uh, I wanted to just quickly go down there because that that was always kind of uh, you you took the penny stocks up to that whole other level. But you ended um, with a lot going on in your life, like you said, and then you said, you know, I want I'm, I'm going full time. But also, um, I was reading through your show notes. You were you were you weren't just this wasn't on a whim, right? You were actually well positioned financially right, right. to go full time trading, right? So I guess walk us through kind of I mean you don't need to give us the fine details of the numbers, but kind of explain the numbers that you had in place from a personal finance perspective um, that allowed you to kind of launch off off from there to go full time trading. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I had um, so I had a business uh, that was. Uh, which is where the Crestron Wizard Park comes from. So Crestron is a company that uh, manufactures automation products, which are you know lighting control, shades, uh, audio, video. You know they're primarily a uh, commercial business. You know, so if you go into you know, universities, uh, a lot of universities use it, um, and then high end homes. So a few years ago, I got into that, and I was flying around. Uh, doing because in a home so at this time around 2000 early 2000s a system cost around a quarter million dollars if you did a you know if you had a house and did a big system you know controlled all the lights and everything so most of my customers were you know expendable income ten thousand square foot houses and bigger uh so of course that was a smaller percentage of the populace that could afford it so i went to them rather than built up the business locally and during my journey to do that, I uh, also started selling the equipment overseas. So I was building the systems and selling them to the UK, South Africa, China, uh, Germany, France. So I ended up, and really, and we can go into that as much as you want, but it, it was really, the overseas selling was really more like I was in arbitrage than really with the equipment because the reason I was making money was because the dollar was weak and the, you know, the euro was strong and so it was more of a price advantage for them to buy from me than it was to buy it in Europe. So. Right, and I remember that kind of when we first talked um, for the first time we interviewed you and that was just like, yep, you're uh, just a savvy business guy. Yeah, talking about kind of the dollars valuation versus these other currencies and stuff like that. So, um, but kind of last we left off, you know, you were doing that as a business. Did you end up selling that business? Right, right. So I sold that gotcha. business. Um, and so I'm still attached as a consultant slash, there's a few clients, uh, mostly uh, on the commercial end, but there's a couple of uh, high net worth individuals too that I still kind of handle their stuff as far as 
making sure they're taken care of and do some designs and things. So, which is some nice extra income, you know, by itself with not a lot of time spent. So that's kind of nice. Right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I guess, let me, let me rephrase the question. I, I was okay. poorly, poorly worded on my part. <laughs> when you went full time trading, I'm assuming that you had some sort of emergency fund in a place. Right, right, right. Okay. You had a, a, a good pile of cash sitting there, I'm, which I'm assuming is coming from the sale of the business. Or in other words, it's not like you were like, well, I'm just gonna become a full-time day trader or I'm gonna right, be a full-time no, yeah. trader. Emergency, I mean, so I guess walk us through, I mean, how many okay. months living expenses did you have You know, in that perspective? Because gotcha. I just want listeners to, to realize that because a lot of people out there make it seem like Oh yeah, you just kind of one day wake up and you can say, I'm, I'm gonna become a full-time trader. Right. And yeah, you can do that, <laughs> but given the psychology of things, which we've talked about many times before, it's not gonna quite work out. However, uh, there are certain situations where yeah, you actually can do it and, and keep the voices, keep the pressures at bay. And I remember that being part of your situation. So, right, I mean, right. what was your finances looking like from gotcha. uh, you know emergency fund and all that? Yeah, so a couple of things that happened. One, uh, I had some commercial property that had a house on it that was uh, for future expansion plans that was part of the uh, sale of the business that part of it was that I kept that. Uh, so, you know, up until I guess that was part of what I was working on when I talked to you last was remodeling the house and all that. And then, you know, happy to say I'm speaking to you now from that house. I'm, li I'm living in the property now. So congrats. Yeah. So that's nice job. So that's free and clear. Uh, so no mortgage and um, then, you know, uh, two and a half acres is his own commercial property. Uh, so at some point there's a lot of building stuff going on. So at some point, you know, it'll be sold and we'll make whatever and move, have to move. But um, so that was one good thing. Uh, and then, you know, no car payments and all that stuff. So that was another. And um yeah, I put some put some money back. So I'd figured when I when when I was talking to you last, I'd figured you know, I had six months that if I was doing it full time and didn't make any other money, that you know, I was good. And you know, right, could, could right. Give it a chance. I really want the listeners. I really want the listeners to understand. Kind of, there was preparation involved in this. This, just like Clay said, this wasn't a. Oh, I think I'm going to become a full time day trader and you know sell my business and you know remodel this house and move in and keep my expenses low. So right. obviously, there was a ton of planning and thoughtfulness that kind of went involved in it. Um, and last, I kind of saw here is that you were looking to trade options. Was is that right? Right, right. So yeah, which is what I'm doing. Um, you know, so and I'm. I'm doing a little bit with real estate too. I'm kind of following in Clay's footsteps on that a little bit. Um, so I guess the, uh, I didn't actually, so we we're looking to start trading in October. And I didn't actually get started till January with moving in, getting this place done and all that. And to start with, uh, to start with my trading options, I was just trading way out of the money options you know, uh, put some in there. Very, very low cost. Yeah, you know, you're looking at 10 cents to, uh, let's say, 50 cents, right? Um, mm -hmm. Options and all that. And actually, I made, you know, January started off good. And I made, actually made some money. You know, I was trading with, uh, I think I only put like five grand in my account. I don't even know if I put that in. Like five grand to start with because I didn't want to have a lot sitting there and be too tempted with it. So, and I only risked, I think I only had at risk at any one time a total of a grand in my account for the month of January. And I think the first couple of weeks, I made like 1400 bucks based off of that grand. So it was like, all right, this is great. You know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's pretty good. You're like, whoo. Well, <laughs> you know, and then, of course, you know, it goes the other way. And, you know, and the thing I figured out that I didn't like about it, so I almost was like, hell with options, I'm done because there was no room to put any stop losses in, right? So you're trading so far out of the money that it's a, it's a gamble, right? It was all or nothing. And maybe it was an informed gamble, but it's still a gamble. Yeah, it was... Uh, uh, right, right. When you're trading ones that are that far out of the money, it's pretty much when your idea is wrong, it's probably going to no bids. Exactly. So fully understand. But to, to loop back a little bit, what, yeah. what was the original reason you decided to focus on options versus, say... Uh, equities or futures or forex or anything like that. Um, well, forex, I'm 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 gonna learn that. I'm I'm getting more into that. But at the 
time. I like the options. Um, well, at the time, the reason I liked the options was because it was more, I acted more like a penny stock, right? It was, hey, you get in and then makes big moves and you can make big profits and you can get out and all that. So that was the original thought to it. The reason I like options now is because I like selling premium. That's almost all I do now. Uh, that's jumping. Uh, that's, how, uh, how, how trading evolves. I love it. Yes, yeah, so that's jumping way ahead, but that's the, the difference, you know. So that's why I've stuck with options is because I finally I sat down and I said, okay, you know, this is stupid. I'm just going to, I'm going to keep rolling and eventually the house is going to win and I'm going to be wiped out. So I'm going to have to figure out, you know, because I, I start back I said, okay, I'm going to go back and listen to, to Clay stuff. And, you know, and I remember like one of the first ones that, that you came out with was, you know, kind of talked about, don't worry about all this stuff. We're going to look at it like just day trade. And then you don't have to worry about all the Greeks and all the stuff and everything. I said, well, I'm not going to, that's probably not the route I'm going right now. So I guess I got to figure out what Delta means and Gamma and, you know, what all this stuff means and what it's going to do to the account and all that. And then I remember I had so much else going on because I've got a hot rod business, you know, going street cars and all that stuff that, I don't really have to build anything out right now, even though I enjoy it by having that time. But I was in the middle of finishing up some cars that ended up doing great and winning, winning awards and all that stuff, which is nice. But it was just taking up my time and I wasn't focusing. And I start watching some videos and, you know, I was just, you ever get where you're on a subject and you're just, your head goes numb. You're just like, oh, I can't even do it. Right. So I was kind of, I was a little, uh, I was a little disheartened. That's a word. Uh, you know, with where it was going. And I said, look, I've got to figure this stuff out. So spent some more time and I don't honestly don't know if it was because some things got, got off my plate or if it just a couple of things clicked, but it just started to click. And I was like, okay, so I, now I know what this is. And it's just, then I look back at some of my old trades and laugh at myself because, you know, if I had taken the time to have learned those things before I made that, I mean, it's so obvious this, you know, the stupidity of some of the trades. So, uh, that's funny though because you I like how thank you for admitting that where it's like yeah. had I just actually studied <laughs> yeah. those dumb mistakes would have been averted mm -hmm. but at the time I mean because I, I was there too I mean when I thought I was going to be a millionaire on a stainless steel muffler company had right. I just actually maybe studied something <laughs> I would have been like wow you're being an idiot right now but yeah. so it's just amazing how the human mind works where um, you know it, you may be thinking that you are studying or that you don't need to study but it's amazing what experience and actual studying will, will, will do for you. One point of clarification, yeah. it, had you gone through the advanced option course at all at this point? Because you okay. mentioned not knowing necessarily. Right, or, right. Or I'll let you pick it up then. Gotcha. So in January when I started up, I had not. And then around, I'm going to say March, but it might, have been a little, it might have been in February. But by March is when I sat down and I went through all the advanced courses uh, and did all that. And uh, I also had gotten away, you know, I know different people ask who they should trade with and all that. And I don't know who everybody's using now, but, you know, I made the trade change from E-Trade to Tasty Works or Tasty Trade or whatever because the, you know, with options, it was just so much cheaper. Um, okay, okay. So just for a point of clarification, I think an, a learning example here, but it sounds like once you had cleared some things off your plate, like you said, and then actually went through the course, AK right. studied, is that when things started to click more for you? They did, you know, that it became better then. And, um, and so what I did then is I said, okay, I'm just going to put on a few different types of trades and see what, you know, see what clicks for me, see what I like. So I was doing some iron condors. I was doing some butterflies and doing some, I started doing more, uh, vertical spreads and then I sold some strangles and, just for me personally, I uh, I haven't made a trade in two three months where I was where I bought anything. I'm selling everything now. Is all my trades are like that. So that's that's what I feel comfortable with. Obviously, you know it's different for different people. What they're, what's going to work for them and uh, the amount of capital you have and all that stuff. Um, well, That's welcome to the dark side of uh, options trading, as I like to call it. Welcome to being a farmer now. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I guess how was how has that been going for you? Because obviously we had a little bit of a turbulent time here. Market's been swinging right, around. Right. Actually, some good volatility. So uh, yeah, how's performance <laughs> been for you know selling side? So that was that was good. So back up one thing that happened to me, which affects you know different people and what they're able to trade, is you know I got hit with the stupid day trading crap, you know rule. Uh, you know, lock my account up, you know, and then you get, you get one pass every 90 days or something. Yeah. So, you know, say ultimately what I've done is I ended up putting the 25 grand in there because I was like, you know, I don't want to deal with it. And also when you're selling premium, you know, you need capital because it's going to tie up your, I call it when I'm explaining it to people, I say they're going to put some of your money in escrow, you know, so you can, uh, when you're trading that position. Yep, that's, a, that's a good way to put yeah, it. Yeah, I was going to say, from a real estate perspective, right. fantastic way to put it. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, so I, I put the money in there so I didn't have to worry about the day trade rule. Um, and, yeah, it went really well. So I traded, um, I sold the most recent ones I did because I had some stuff up to see. I've been back testing to see. So my biggest problem, I'll go forward with this, but I'm going to say this. My biggest issue in trading, whether it was pennies or anything is and still is the right time to sell, right? That's my biggest nemesis is, you know, how long do you stay in when you sell, blah, 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 blah. So that's been my issue. But I was in uh, I was in Netflix and Tesla and uh, Bid You, that's some of the Amazon, but I didn't. Amazon was actually an iron condor in that. Um, and so then I'll go in, you know, and I'll back test it just to see what happened because, you know, Tesla, I was on uh, vacation, 4th of July week, you know, I decided to take that first crap then. And I went ahead, I held it after that, though, but I went ahead and, and closed some positions out because you know, I was in Germany last week and I didn't want to be holding stuff into earnings. Uh, although I looked, I back tested everything today and had I held, I would have made another, you know, another 30% or more each trade than what I did. So, yeah. Hans, I, told Hans, I got a quick yeah. question for you, though. Okay. So you had mentioned, uh, you know, back when you were doing iron condors and verticals and all, all those right, things, right. That just kind of kind of feel my way out, feel what I liked, feel what I didn't like. So my, my question is, let's say you didn't like something. What was the criteria? What was you know, what went into that final decision of, ah, I really don't feel comfortable with that. Like you said, uh, it's going to be different for everybody. Right. But what were your kind of criteria for deeming whether or not something fit into, um, you know, your personal risk tolerance? Gotcha. Good, good question. So for me, most of the issue came into play of, you know, I tie up and, you know, risk and reward, right? So I would tie up uh, what I thought was too much money. Like, let's say, a couple, I mean, a grand or something, even doing a vertical spread or something. I tie this money up to try and make 75 bucks was the max you could make or 125 or, you know, whatever. And then, but when I found those high volatility plays, like with Tesla, you know, I risked, I think they tied up three grand for me to make 700 or something. It was, it was great. I mean, it was, you know, the other way. So, um, you know, for me, that was the biggest thing, which, you know, everybody, doesn't have the capital to to tie up so it makes a difference with your i think that's the thing that affects your trade and play the most if i was still trading with a smaller which i'd like to have a much bigger account we can talk about that too but uh if i was trading with a lot smaller account then i'd be forced to you know i wouldn't have that option anyway so for me it was just how can i best use the capital that i've got what makes sense to me i guess so it just seemed like i was tying up too much was and then so many of the, and the, so with the, with the strangle, so if I'm selling a strangle, I'm way out. I'm at like the five or 10 Delta, right? So I'm way, way out uh, when I, when right. I sell those. So I've got a really good, you know, very high probability of making money. And, you know, with the, with everything else, you had to be in more, you know, a lot closer. And it just seems like, seems like what I'm doing now gives me more room for error, if I'm being honest. <laughs> So, you know. Oh, no, that's uh, that's completely true. It gives you a lot of wiggle room right. to essentially be completely wrong and still make money on it. That's uh, that's probably one right. of the main reasons why I love it so much. That's it, too. So, and then the other thing is, you know, I, I remember, uh, 
I was in a class one time about compute because part of my job was writing software. And there was this different way of writing software. I'm in class and the guy was like, hey, and this is the keys to the kingdom, right? He's telling you how to write software. And the same thing kind of happened with options. And, you know, going back to your earlier question, Clay, you know, talking about, I think it was Clay or Taz, you know, about why you chose options versus the other stuff is being able to adjust the trade. It's just that that really appeals to me because I like to tinker with stuff all the time. So being able to come in and it's like a little bonsai tree, right? You wake up that morning, you look at it and you, you know, you adjust your trade a little bit and you make a couple of little adjustments or whatever. And you get the squirt bottle out and go, yeah, sick. Sick. And get a little right. water. And, yeah. Am I going am I, am I to roll this one up? I think that's the title. It's like a bonsai tree and I'm just going to leave the titles that Her. people will have to, because that's a perfect example. I love it, Jeff. Sorry to cut you off. No, but good. As a fan, as a, as a man of analogies, Props to you. That's fantastic stuff. But yeah, keep on going. No, that's that's exactly what it's. I love that part of it. Now you know, being once I figured that out, that was like that's what it was that clicked the light bulb. I think was, hey, I can roll these things in. I can roll out. I don't have to lose money except on paper, right? I mean, you can roll forever as long as you've got the capital. As long right. as you got the capital, right? I mean, that's the that's the key to this whole strategy. Is you know, if you've got the capital to tie up, of course, then it's at some point you just say. All right, I'm I'm getting out, taking my loss, and hopefully it's not a terrible loss, and because you know, I can put this capital in better use. But yeah, right. That's uh, that's part of having a high win rate, though, is that you do get uh, those occasional ones that just totally get away, right. and there's not really too much to do. Yeah, where you but, gonna... um, yeah, those are very you know few and far between, especially when you're trading the deltas you're yeah. trading. But um, you, you kind of brought up something that uh, piqued my interest okay. here. You said you're trying to, you, you have a, you put more money in your account now, but you said you wanted to grow it to a larger account. Yes. What you said you want to go into that. What do you mean? So, you know, I've been looking at, you know, what amount of money do I need to have to trade, to really trade full time and afford, you know, to get, be able to pull money out of the account where I'm paying bills with it, not just growing it. Right. So, you know, and that number is pretty high probably, uh, you know, I've got some, I've got some hot, a couple of hot rod vehicles stuff that I built, and I'm gonna sell. I, I want to grow my account where I'm trading with a hundred thousand instead of around thirty now that I've got. Um, what's hope about thirty five? But you know, I want to get it up there, um, just because you have a, you need capital to, to trade options the way I'm trading them and be successful. And uh, let's face it, I mean, if you're having, you know big, big percentage wins year after year, then, you know, uh, you should probably be a fund manager or something. So, you know, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to have 50% years, year after year after year, right? So uh, I need that larger account to give me a better, better shot at making the money I want to make with it, if that makes sense. So that makes sense. I don't know. Can you guys hear anything in the background? Yeah, sorry. Kids running around. Yeah. Okay. All right. I got four. I got mm -hmm. four. So I'm with you. Yeah, it's, it's fine. I, I don't want people to think that there's uh, everything is fine. No need to call the police or anything like that. But uh, I can tell that I I fully believe that you have four kids because the way you talk through that without even you know oh. being distracted at all. Oh, yeah, yeah it, it's very clearly you can you can deal with it. But um, <laughs> I guess what I, I'm starting to discover, and you made a couple points, is what you actually would need to day trade for a full time trader. So it's not like you're necessarily full time, and I'm the same way. Right, you're like, right. are you a full time trader? I'm like, well, technically speaking, no, because I have other income streams that are right, coming right. in. So to say that full time is the only stream of income, that's actually not being, you know, that, right. that's just not really the case. So what are these? I mean, trading is an income, just like it's an income for me and an income for Chez, but. What are these other incomes that you have? You did mention the consulting, right? So you don't have to give us exact numbers, yeah. but I, I, I think this is because really, from a personal finance perspective, this is what everybody should be striving for to build wealth over the long term. And this is I, this isn't really my opinion. This isn't really Ches's opinion. It's kind of just a, a mathematical fact. Is the more numbers that you have coming into a spreadsheet, the better that spreadsheet's going to look over time. Right. So I guess. What are these other streams of income? You have consulting. Yeah. Uh, are there any other yeah, ones? Yeah, yeah. Or I, and I guess how much do each one kind of weigh on your 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 monthly budget that kind of compensates for the shortfall that maybe the the trading isn't gotcha. quite getting to where you want it to gotcha. go? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah. So, okay. So cool. from a you know from a mile mile weight to the big picture is I'm kind of doing what you say in a lot of your 
your uh, weekly emails to people, which is, hey, if you want to grow your account, get a job, which is so, ticker J O B. <laughs> yeah. So I am not taking any money out of my trading account. I'm only adding. Um, Love it. Yeah. So I mean, until it gets to two hundred grand, money's not coming out of it because that's kind of the number I'm shooting for ultimately to be trading with to say that I could sit here and that's all I did. Right. So, uh, you know, my bills get paid with the consulting, um, and then I build cars. So we take it, really any car, but, um, the classic cars are more like the 60s stuff, put fuel injected engines in them. We change the suspension. You know, we do all the stuff like to make them like new cars. And then, uh, I've got a couple of race cars. So we drag race them. So we race, uh, build some race cars and do that stuff. That's why I was almost late to the thing. We're kind of going over a build I've got now. We're doing a thousand horsepower twin turbo street car for a guy. So, you know, we, yes, yeah, so we do, you know, cars. Um, and then I, for clarification, yeah. this is a, this is a for-profit business, Correct. right? Yeah. Not just a no, hobby. No, yeah. This is, okay. this is other people for profit or supposed to be for profit. And then, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a very fine gray area when yeah. it comes to stuff which i'm assuming you enjoy to do yeah i do so that's that's for profit stuff and then kind of an offshoot of the consulting uh, just it, it kind of came hand in hand with that because of the the high net worth individuals i was meeting so i do uh, almost kind of like property management you know like you let's say you've got a client and you know they've got this 14,000 square foot house and they only come to it five times a year. And when they come, they want everything to work and, you know, but all this maintenance keep, keeps going. doesn't matter that they're not there. So, you know, just from being in the business so long and knowing people and in the construction business. So, uh, kind of facilitate some people. So they'll, they'll pay a month, they'll pay a yearly retainer for me to make sure that their stuff gets handled. Uh, so nice. And, you know, so yeah. I, that's about four streams of income. Are there any other ones? Uh, not yet. If I can get the kids out there doing. Are you? Do you? <laughs> do you invest? Like, do you have uh, any sort of uh, dividends that are coming yeah. or anything like that? Well, so that's that's on that's on the page for next step because I, I want. So two of the things I want to do is I want to be investing in some in some stuff that's paying some dividends, and I also want to start. Maybe I'll do some covered. You know, if I do find a stock I like and do some covered, you know, where I can be selling premium every week and kind of bringing that cost basis down. And uh, I'd like to do some of that. Uh, I've got, you know, I've got the retirement account that's in ETFs that kind of handles itself. That's up. You know, it's actually, you know, some days I look at it and wonder if I should just put everything. I think it's up 17% for the year or something. Um on its own. And then actually this morning I put, uh, I've created a couple of, uh, custodial accounts for my, so I've got four kids, two of them are in college and two of them are in grammar grade. So I got big, you know, big wide variants there. So I went ahead and created a, uh, couple of accounts for them. So I put back cause I'm seeing how much college costs and all that fun stuff. So, well, Nice, nice. So, you're, so A plus for you for from the parenting perspective, that's good stuff. Um, I guess, so you have all this stuff going on and I don't want to assume anything, but as far as the, the hot rods are concerned and the consulting, and I guess maybe that management that you have, I mean, the two I'm assuming you enjoy to do, the consulting and the, the, the hot rod stuff, yeah. is that fair? Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's probably fair. Okay, and then the other one is I'm probably that's probably more just a typical job type thing. Yeah, but you know I don't. Or do you actually, or do you enjoy that? That's too? okay because it kind of goes hand in hand, and I'm not overloading it. It's not like a ridiculous number. It's just you know a few people that that you know kind of pays out pretty good. So uh, okay, all right. I, I guess what I'm trying to get at and to just offer some inspiration to listeners is. Maybe thinking, well, geez, Jeff's got all sorts of stuff going on. He does, but when you actually are doing stuff that you enjoy to do, that's kind of a little trick that uh, very clearly Jeff has discovered, um, and that you know I, I definitely have discovered too. Is when you're doing stuff that you like, try to figure out a way to turn it into uh, some sort of for-profit thing, because then that makes doing a bunch of stuff a lot easier uh, when you enjoy it. You know, it goes back. I don't know if it's a, a famous quote or not, but you know, if you like what you do, then it's not right, work. Right. Right, so exactly. try to learn how to monetize what you like to do 
and you know then all of a sudden you just show up and do it so i mean is yeah. that a fair it sounds no, like that's yeah. kind of what you're doing jeff you've located things you like to do which makes your life easier to do them and all these other things because well it's not work to you in the first place is that pretty much what you got going on for yourself yeah yeah that's it i mean it's if i'm being real honest i'm too busy though because it just gets a little crazy stuff and it's the jobs the j the job stuff wouldn't be too busy but you know to cut down on overhead and make it make sense i moved the hot rod business from the town i grew up in that was 45 minutes away and i moved it here because i've got you know i'm saying commercial and i've got acres i built a building and moved it okay number one thing i hate in the world is moving and uh it's moving all this crap and i mean i've got stuff everywhere and just getting going through boxes and getting organized so you know if i get this that kind of stuff off of me then yeah the the regular job stuff isn't too bad but uh, it's just the yeah so dumb stuff. it sounds like you're definitely trending in that way that is kind of your your big picture type goal is to get you to a spot where you're you're at multiple streams of income but all those incomes are coming from things that you right you know actually enjoy right. doing um so Awesome, awesome. Now, before I forget, because I mean, you you made a, a comment, so we'll kind of bring this back into actual trading here. But uh, this morning, at, let's see, ten twenty-five a.m. Eastern time. Oh yeah. yeah. And I quote, <laughs> "My screen is clear. Kind of nice after forty open positions for thirty yeah. days." So it sounds like, you know, I want to talk more about your, your your strategy that you're doing. We know you're selling premium and right. all that, but it sounds like you're 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 you got a pretty big farm, or I guess just kind of walk us through how you actually, you know, implement your strategy, you know, how many positions and, and all that good right. stuff. Well, a lot of that came from, and probably, it's probably been a little longer than 30 days, right? But most of that much being open came from me trying out different strategies. So I had a quite a few iron condors open and I had a bunch of, uh, excuse me, a bunch of spreads and all that still, still going on. And of course, almost all of those strategies are, you know, wait, waiting it out, right? You know, letting the time, letting the clock run out, or at least try and get to twenty-five to fifty percent of max what you can make, and all that kind of stuff. So that was a lot of the reason for a lot of them. I even had I had a couple of calendar spreads out there, so I had uh, I had gold, <laughs> and so I rolled. How many times did I roll it? I think I, I rolled the uh, front month up or down. Yeah, whichever it was. I, I rolled it probably five times and made 80 bucks a time or something, you know, trying to, so, but then it was still at the end of the day, once all said and done, it still came out of loss because the back one never did what it was supposed to do. And that it crapped out, but I ended up turning it into an iron condor in the back month and kept waiting it out and just, you know, you open up your screen and you got to scroll down to look at all your position. That's a problem. <laughs> you, know, you need to be able to just open it. Yeah. That's a, uh, that's a, that's a yeah, good that was right there. So I was like, Hey, I got to get this off here. And that's, that's still one of the issues is, you know, seeing the red bothers me. And so the main thing I complaint, I guess I've got, and I don't know what they would do about it, but you know, as soon as you roll it and you take that profit out, tasty trade doesn't keep up with that. I mean, it still shows you as, I don't know the easiest way to explain it by talking about it, but you know, maybe you've seen it, Chaz, and you guys seen it, but you know, you could show, uh, uh, like bid you when I finally closed it out. So you could show a hundred dollar loss, but you're really only twenty dollars loss because you rolled it and made eighty bucks. You know what I'm saying? And it you follow me. Right, right. Yeah, I have to look at the the year to date stats on my positions usually to kind of figure out because I've been rolling Facebook for three cycles okay. now. So yeah, I'm fully aware that that's well, how I gotta I'll, keep track maybe of I'll it. Try that. Then. So that that's a problem, you know. So I've got spreadsheets that I keep up with it. I make my own spreadsheets now and keep up with that because that that frustrates you because you open it up and like, holy crap, I'm down fifteen hundred dollars in Amazon, but I'd really pulled like thirteen hundred out. So I was down two hundred bucks or whatever. Right, right. It's not, uh, right. It's not as bleak as right. it so looks. That, that's yeah. a problem. Um, and I just hate seeing the red, but, you know, if you're going to, especially if you're going to sell premium, you're going to see red until you know, you're getting close to expiration sometimes. And it's just how it is. You just got to deal with it. So uh, I, don't know, I got off on a tangent, but that's a, uh, but yeah, so, so yeah, I had a ton of open stuff, trying out different things. And, uh, you know, I closed out. I think I only had four positions left when I went to Germany. And then uh, I waited that Monday while I was in Germany. I went ahead and closed out a couple because I just, 
you know, I, like I said, I back tested. I would have made more if I held them, but I just didn't want to be on vacation and be six hours off and trying to manage it. So I closed them out. I mean, I closed them out for profits. The profits always good. Always take profits, right? So, so did that. And, yeah, especially so. So, so I got okay. another question for you. Considering you trade similar to me, do you have uh, kind of set targets in advance, like yeah. you target fifty yeah. percent yeah. or you target twenty five percent or anything like that? Do you leave those orders resting, or are you just uh, uh, when it gets around? It depends there, you order on. Place? It depends on how active I'm going to be. So if I'm going to be around, I might not have an order in. But if I'm not, yeah, I'll usually set one. And if it's just strictly. If I'm just strictly selling premium, you know, sold strangle, that's it. You know, did a strangle, then um, I'm looking for 50%. Uh, and then, like, if it's something else, like an iron condor, if it was a, yeah, like a credit spread or something, then like 25% is usually more, more in line with uh, what I'm looking for on that. And as far as, as far as time wise, I mean, are you looking? What's the ideal amount of time you'd you'd like to see in a position? To an obviously, I mean, you'd like to immediately go in your favor. Yeah, next day exactly. But as a, as a realistic average ballpark, okay. you know, what kind of what is uh, what would you call ideal? So I right, re- right based in reality. Based in, there we go. Ideal based in based reality. Based in reality, I'd like to if if it's just straight selling premium, I'd like to see a couple weeks is nice. Um, I have to see it tending to be a little more than that. Um, cause usually I'm trading out 30 to 45 days to expiration is what I'm looking at on a lot of my stuff. Go ahead. Chaz, where do you fall in this discussion? As like you said, you two are both option farmers. Uh, so I mean, are, are you in, in line or reality? Of course. Yeah, I'm, but, okay. that's, yeah. I'm usually targeting the same exact, uh, you know, time to expiration and stuff like that in terms of, cause that's when you get the most uh, right, decay right. for your state. So in the thing you want to avoid is gamma killing you right at the end. So trying I'm, I'm usually trying to have let's say a position hasn't been great then by the time i'm getting up on 10 days expiration i'm trying to be made a decision all right i'm dumping this thing i'm rolling it out um you know whatever i'm doing sometimes you know hey maybe it's it looks good just go ahead and hold it but usually i'm uh wanting to be out of it by within a week to go or more, a little more than a week ago. Now it, you said it, it looks good, so you may hold it. What is what? What is looking good? The the, the chart itself, or some other uh, part of your strategy? Yeah. So, all right, let's see something. Pull up a real time thing. So, like Netflix, right? I had the uh, August thirds, which right, which I've already closed out, but it's ten days ago now. So if I look back at where my position, if I duplicate and look back at it. Uh, my calls that I sold would be are worthless now, which is great. So I would have made 100% on that because I was at the 485s. And the puts that I sold were the only thing I would have to still worry about was the 345s, which is close. I mean, that's 10 bucks, right? Yeah, I'm looking at the chart yeah, now. Close. So it's three, what, mid range is 350, so around $3.60. So I would have already closed that. I wouldn't risk that. You know, like I said, I closed it before because I was on vacation. But if I was sitting here ten days ago and it's getting that low, I would have closed the whole position by now anyway. But but let's say that Netflix, that same chart, let's say Netflix was around three seventy five or something, I might go ahead and hold it. But yeah, you know, but if I'm at fifty percent, I'm out. There's no reason to get greedy and get your head whacked like chicken going through the factory, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. So, I mean, if you're at 50. If I'm at 50, I'm out. And let's say the chart is just. Go ahead. Give, but, give me an example. But, hey, but example. what happens if the chart is so beautiful? <laughs> Jeff, it's the most beautiful chart you've ever seen. You're still out at 50? Uh, it depends. So, if it's. Okay. Oh, hey, what, what happened? I, I'm, <laughs> I'm out. You, you fell in front right. of my trap. You're supposed to say I'm out at 50. Well, I don't know. I guess, I guess no, you didn't fall <laughs> for the trap because um, I guess Chez. I, before I pose this question to you, Chez, you like you want to be out at fifty percent? I literally set my target the minute nice. after I enter a trade, and I don't care if it completely keeps going well past. Clay, like smart. I said, I'm playing yeah. just a numbers game, and that's that's just how I do it, and that's how I've always been doing. Yeah, because the minute yeah, I get yeah. greedy, and I'm like, oh look, it's at sixty five, is when it'll go back down to thirty percent. I'll be yeah. like, well, I should just take I should 50 be, every, like every, every, yeah. Okay, so you are so Chez is straight up mechanical. Everyone should be like Chez, um, and. <laughs> No, well, they, I don't no, know. I'm no, not he's, necessarily he's saying right. that because <laughs> he's right okay. on that. So you're not willing. 
I guess what I'm trying to get across is that, you know, there's some, I'm, you know, we won't name names, but some people are out there, they almost make it seem like you don't need a chart at all, you don't use a chart, all you do is play the now, numbers. And, you know, you just play the statistics and all that sort of stuff. But uh, I know Ches uses charts yeah. in his analysis, but, you know, where do where do charts stop being applied in the strategy is kind of what yeah. I'm trying to dig into. And, and for Ches, it sounds like the chart stops being applied you know, after he's into a trade and, you know, assuming, you know, if it hits 50%, right. you don't care. That's where the charts, you, you just don't care about the charts anymore. But it's not like you don't care about charts at all, like some people proclaim. Is that fair, Chaz? Yeah, no, I absolutely use charts mainly, I'd say, 85% for entry specifically. Like, I don't want to be going short something that's, you know, sitting on, right. you know, support right now. This ideally I'd be on the other side of that trade. So that's, I'm using charts mainly to enter, but from there, I don't really need it too much. The, the big thing I do in monitor is just, I'd like to see, you know, big levels of support and resistance not broken. Even if it does break though, remember, you know, like Jeff was saying, we have kind of a big buffer <laughs> right. to be wrong. Like uh, say support levels at a hundred dollar mark for whatever stock it is, I might be shorting the nineties or something. So I essentially have $10 to be wrong. And even if it does break my original thesis of it going up from a hundred, um, I'm still gonna make money on it. So yeah, that's uh, I use charts pretty much for entry specifically. Um, I'll watch it while I'm managing it, but more often than not, I'm not using it for right. exiting or anything like that. Now, do you think, Ches, do you think you can play, you know, it depends for like 50%, so if something hits 50%, um, I mean, do you think there's still wiggle room for charts and it depends, like if it's, like I said, a beautiful, beautiful setup, or do you think you should still just get out at 50%? I mean, what's your opinion on that? Because like I said, I'm not saying um, either way is right or wrong, it's just, you know, a discussion point. Sure, sure, no, if I, uh, I'm, I'm, I've, I'll be interested to see if Jeff agrees with me on this. If I traded larger sizes, I might consider right. taking half off of my targets or three quarters off of my target, and then using uh, you know whatever method you want to use to trail a, a winning trade. Um, that might be something that's more applicable though. But more often than not, Clay, my account is kind of taxed because I trade it you know naked, like Jeff was saying. Yeah. It, it takes a lot of capital to kind of trade this way, so I don't have the luxury of having like a bunch of you know options trades on. I might have one lots or two lots. So in that case though, if I was trading, you know, 10 lots or 20 lots or whatever it was, I'd probably consider taking off 50 to 75% of the position and then managing in a more traditional like RVR type way. Um, but that, that that's just how I would apply it. I'm kind of- I was gonna ask you yeah, about what, that. what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, Jeff? I was gonna ask about, you know, if you step in the trades and step out, so like, um, because even still, I, I don't try to get too big in one position, even if it looks like it's going to be really good. But I'll step in sometimes. So, you know, if I let you know, like if I let's say I got something and did a strangle, and I look the next you know couple of days, and and this is a funny indicator for me. I don't know if you use this chest or it just sounds stupid, but what I do is like uh, I think I did this on Tesla. Maybe it was like I sold. I sold a put, sold a call, way out of the money, and the next day, I was down like a hundred dollars. But when I opened up, the stock hadn't really moved, so it was the only reason I was losing was because of implied vol you know, the volatility had gone up. So yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. I sold. Yeah, expansion. I sold two more, but further out, I went. I went out even further. I went like ten dollars out, even more either direction. Sold another contract, right? Because I was still still confident with it. But that was like a that's an easy way to see that volatility has expanded because oh i'm losing money so in, in the stock minute move you know on both sides of it so uh, i'll step in like that but i usually don't have a lot of contracts just because i'm not in a position yet where i want to have you know i don't want to have a really large percentage of my account in one position um Right, you're better off doing your 40, 45 names spread out on smaller right. position sizes than doing, say, 15 with a bigger size because you can you open yourself up for a real world right. of hurt if you and get then, too concentrated. And, you know, but I agree with what you're saying. You know, you should trade often. It's better to trade often and get out and be mechanical than it is to trade, you know, only 10 trades a month or something and, and uh, try and hold out for max max profit you know, you're better off trade because that's where the number that's where that whole percentage of profit thing comes into play you know you've got to trade you know thousand times a year or something and then that's going to work out for you right 
Right, right. Yeah, it's just, um, you know, like we always say, it's like being the casino. Don't get me wrong. There's people who pull the lever and hit the jackpot. But I assure you that there's thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of other people that pull yeah. the lever and don't thousands. make any money at all. So <laughs> that's uh, at the end of the day, really if you do built. enough, what, what is it? The uh, your uh, the hell's the word I'm looking for when you have a certain size of, you know, when you're trying to run numbers and you've got your uh, crap, I can't think. Yeah, yeah, like a sample yeah your size? sample size. So sample size. it's the same thing with flipping a quarter or playing the casino or playing options or whatever. If your sample size is small, it's a crapshoot. But if you have a large, you know, sample size, then the numbers that you're seeing, I mean, they're pretty much going to probably work out. I mean, if you're mechanical about it, then I mean, it's gonna, it's probably gonna, you know, work out just like you think it should at the end of the year. You know? so, but. Uh, yeah, this, this is good stuff. And what I found fascinating to. to Chez's point is, it sounds like, you know, this is, a, I get it, the sound bite is, well, everybody's right. different. <laughs> well, what, what the heck does that actually mean? Yeah, everybody's different sounds good, and it's true, but what does that actually mean? Well, here we've got a little micro example of exactly what that means. To Chez's and Jeff's point, it sounds like, especially in, in Chez's case, if he had more contracts, you know, because he was trading, you know, had a bigger account, and, and just so a, a product of circumstances, then he would, his charts would actually, be factored more and more into the strategy himself because as he said you know he may be willing to to just take off a, a portion of the position rather than the whole thing if he had a bigger account and if he could do bigger positions so it's not like the way jeff and ches are talking i mean if you have 15 million dollars and you're listening to this you could definitely have little micro details different a part of your plan because well you just have a right. bigger account so I, I i find that fascinating and, and just a great example of well everybody's different well sometimes different is just you know what are your what's the overall circumstances that you're with um so you know it, it, there's no that's why i can't stand blanket rules when people are like nope charts don't apply with <laughs> options just follow the numbers well what happens if the chart is telling you that there's a high likelihood that those numbers can get right. even better and well i don't know what, what's your position because like you said probability pro i mean there's just so many basically that's why i'm going to title this it's like a bonsai tree because especially in, with the advanced options, it really is with all the tweaking and stuff you can do. Um, like I said, that was a, a perfect example of that. So yeah, that's why these welcome backs are great. Oh, the, the little, yeah, the little, the little, down. The little stuff that's you learn, stuff. right? I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. The bigger the account, you definitely can do different things. Um, uh, you know, you can get killed quick too, though. If you, if you're, if you put too much out there, but, but I mean, theoretically speaking, you could have a bunch of, you could have, let's just say, 100 positions spread, or, spread across, and each one of those positions could actually be pretty huge compared to what right, somebody else may right. think is, wow, you have that one position that's that big? Wait, you have 99 more, but, oh, well, yeah, but if I'm a, a huge account. So it's it's amazing where just, uh, that's why there are no universal rules. I mean, there's general rules, right? Manage risk, there's a general rule, but that's just you know a, a very right. blanket statement one, but. Um, yeah, that, that's some good stuff. So let's see. Looking at the time, um, were there any other talking points that you wanted to bring up or kind of fill us in? Mm. It sounds like you're still narrowing things down. You're still yeah, uh, still you know, making adjustments, uh, figuring stuff out. Yeah. I mean, you what's that? Yeah, still making adjustments and making some changes and and figuring things out, watching videos and seeing what other people are doing and uh, you know and growing the account. Hopefully. Would you would you go ahead? From the impression that I've gotten, it sounds like you're definitely in an uptrend because you've actually started a study. You've cleared your plate off to the point where you can focus on this stuff. So, would you agree that your, your account and just your under, understanding improvement has been, you know, uptrending oh, in the yeah, bullish yeah. direction? Yeah, because I'm at, like I said, I'm at a little over 33 right now, and I started with 25. So, you know, and I didn't start with 25 till March. So that's three five months. But you know, that's great. But I want to get to the point where I'm like. I want to grow at five grand a month, right? So either I've got to trade with more capital or I've got to get better. <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, you just keep on, uh, I mean, that's eight, no, 25, not 2,500, that's 25,000 right, right. to 33,000, right. right? Yeah, so that's that's 8,000 and how many months you said? Uh, March to now, so what's that, five? Uh, yeah, what is that, two, three, three four, four months, seven, four so about months. two grand a month? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So about 10 per, So I mean, let's, let's I mean, yeah, ten percent. You know, walk into your local bank and be right. like, "Excuse me, ma'am, here's 
$25,000, I would like 10% per month on this and record her reaction, because I assure you, you'll probably be escorted out for <laughs> taking to the nut house to request 10% per week at your local bank. But, uh, and I mean, let's just look at it from a, a, a strict numbers perspective. I mean, for listeners out there, what could you do with an extra $2,000 in your pocket every month? I can think about a lot of stuff that, uh, I mean, let's see, I don't know, for a nice, all-inclusive Mexican Caribbean vacation, what is that, like 1,500 bucks a person, yeah. 2,000 bucks a person? So I mean, Jeff's paying for a trip down to Mexico or you know, someplace like that. <laughs> Trying to pay. Essentially. <laughs> his monthly Lambo yeah. payment. Yeah, his monthly yeah. Lambo yeah, I got, payment. I got some I mean, videos so, I mean, of that. I got some videos of some Lambos yeah, while I was in Germany. That was good. <laughs> nice, nice. Pay for and my Germany trip. I'm waiting for the Instagram account where you're, you're taking pictures in front of them, proclaiming their ears and stuff. and. Uh, your new trading robot probably hits the market pretty soon, right? That's well, gonna <laughs> guarantee you the profits to, to, to buy those Lambos yeah. that uh, yeah, are in the picture with you. Yeah, you, you can buy in now. There we go. But yeah, <laughs> guaranteed. Exactly. That, a word you always want to use in the market. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's. I would say two thousand grand extra. I can think about a lot to do with two thousand grand per month. So I mean, I, and that's great. You have a goal. You want to get up to five. But uh, you know, good habits, which it sounds like you're building, that's what's gonna take you up there because if you're not taking any money out of your account, yeah, yeah. well then that thing's gonna keep on growing and you can slowly inch up the position sizes and all that and uh, yeah, yeah, it's scalable. Yeah. Good habits are scalable. Right. And uh, they're definitely scalable to $5,000 a month, if not more. I mean, five million yeah. a month, that's a whole different discussion. But yeah, that's 5,000, yeah. You can, would you agree with that, Chaz? Good habits are scalable to 5,000 a month? Well, yeah, definitely. He just keeps doing what works for him and just, uh, like you said, ratcheting up position sizes slowly. So you're just using a percentage of your account like you already were doing. And yeah, you'll go from 2000 to 3000 to 4000 to 5000 probably faster than you can even believe it. Do you guys yeah. um, do you guys trade SPX much? Chas? I do not. I do. Chas. Clay doesn't. Yeah. yeah. I do. A good, good couple people in the in the chat room do as well. It's just, uh, yeah, it's it's pretty easy to get uh, some juice in that name. Yeah. It's kind of a bigger product. Yeah, that's where you are, need Do you trade it or are you I, thinking of trading it or? Uh, I, tra I trade it sometimes. I mean, that's, so that and commodities would be nice, um, you know, to be able to get into more where, I'd like to be in anything that has high volatility and doesn't have earnings would be great. But. Uh, right, right. You know. How do you how do you usually deal with that? Do you you know, I know some people like I traded a week after, I guess, and a couple of them or maybe even a couple of weeks after, but then some people trade the week of. I mean, I know it's all over the place, I guess, but Yeah, there's um a couple different schools of thought. For the most part, I try to avoid earnings in the sense that yeah. I'll move into indexes during kind of earnings season <laughs> after say I've closed out positions prior to earnings. Uh, but then there's other trades that I'm fully confident in kind of doing a earnings trade on it and just keeping it low risk. Right. Um, to be honest with you, the only one that's really kind of burned me this year, this season is Facebook, where right. I'm still sitting in since last quarter and their <laughs> earnings are uh, in like tomorrow. So <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I've essentially, I've rolled it into another earnings trade. So nice. we'll see how that goes. And, and this is kind of one of those trades where, like you said, um, if I recover half my loss or, you know, more than that, I'll probably just clip this and call it a day because this is, I mean, Clay, you know, the Facebook chart on the daily, it's just been in it's beast mode ever since it's earnings. Yeah. Like oh, it yeah. just hasn't stopped and that's, that's fine. But at some point I need to kind of, you know, hop off of this runaway train. So yeah. Right. Yeah, I just rolled it into another earnings trade, but more <laughs> often than not, I try to move into indexes that don't have, uh, any kind of, uh, you know, issues with earnings. Yeah. Right. All Facebook yeah. chart has proven is that people do not care about their privacy. They would much rather be able to creep on other people's lives. That's all the Facebook chart is telling you right now is privacy <laughs> versus creeping on others. I choose creeping on others because Facebook absolutely, re I mean, crazy, crazy the move it's made after what some thought was like huh. end of the world type news. But uh, yeah. like uh, Tesla's nope. got right now. <laughs> How? Let me pull up the oh. Tesla chart real quick. That yeah, thing, what's it doing? Yeah, uh, that was. If it can break down through, uh, what is that, 275? Yeah. That things could get nasty there, but it's got a ways to. Yeah, it was get not good. That was just, it just didn't look good on them. Oh, well. Yeah, but uh, no yeah, we Tesla's obviously a very, uh, I don't know what to fight, dev divisive stock, but there's lots of opinions on, on Tesla out there. Te and uh, I know. I know our producer Nate has some in his retirement. He's got like three shares at one eighty something. So I don't want to oh, say nice. too much bad stuff because I don't need him suing Chez and I because uh, we bashed this stock and now his you know 
He lives in Elon, <laughs> Elon yeah. Musk. Elon Musk is the Howard Hughes of our day. That's exactly is, uh, what he is. And I think he's great. I like the guy, but he's the you know the Howard Hughes where he got the money from the government. He was building the planes and you know just. But he was he was all about he wanted the biggest plane, the fastest plane. He was, he was all about the technology and hey, use use whatever means to to make it happen so i like the guy but. yeah no he uh he's a he's definitely a good salesman that's for sure yeah. and he's a, a visionary but sometimes i don't know i guess only the time will tell and that's what makes the market so awesome so well jeff yep. we're at about an hour um, yeah thank you very much for coming oh, back thank you. and actually thank you for volunteering i know you reached out to us which makes ches and i's life very very easy so i appreciate yeah, it's that. good it's like it's and, like a, uh, it's like an audio diary you know once a year figure out what's happening and, you know. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's you're going. you're always a good time to talk to, easy easy to talk to, which makes our lives again easier. So, uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out, oh, and uh, we will certainly have you back again. Perfect, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. For, yep, for you listeners out there, final few things. First, if you're listening on the YouTube channel, make sure to check out the channel as a whole. Lots of other videos, live trades. There's a vlog, quick tip videos, good variety. So check it out. Hopefully, you decide to subscribe. If you're listening at claytrader.com on the show notes page. Make sure to leave us a comment, hit that share button. We do read the comments and we'll reply. And then finally, and probably the most important one, if you're listening on iTunes or any of the other podcast players, subscribe. And especially on iTunes, if you could leave us a rating, uh, that helps us out quite a bit and goes a long, long way. And uh, Ches and I would really appreciate it. So thank you again to you as listeners for staying with us. And yeah, we'll see you back next week. This has been the Stock Trading Reality Podcast. Thanks for taking the time to hang out. To learn more about Clay and the Clay Trader community, including the trading team, premium training, and more, visit claytrader.com.